This is episode number 89, featuring artist Deborah Hughes. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plein Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Well, this podcast is brought to you by Fall Color Week. It's our paint camp coming up in October, and it's a chance to roll out of bed, have your meals served to you, paint a couple pieces a day, hang with friends. There's no competition, no workshop, no show, just a chance to paint and paint a lot and hang out with people who are part of the plein air scene, which, of course, you will be too. This year, we're doing Fall Color Week in the amazing Canadian Rockies, we're staying at a really wonderful resort, uh, and we're going to be doing visits to Banff and Lake Louise, which are stunning places to paint. And all the places we're going are stunning places to paint. It's a ball. We all become very close after spending a week together in these events. I've discovered many painters that we've ended up putting in the magazine because we didn't know about them before. So it's cool. Uh, so visit us at publishersinvitational.com or fallcolorweek.com. Either one will work, and you can learn about that event. The interview is also underwritten by the Plein Air Convention, probably the only time we're ever going to do the convention in San Francisco. We just got lucky and got the dates and a rate that everybody can afford. It's coming up in April, and the lineup is yet to be announced, although we've got some incredible painters already on the website. You can check them out at pleinairconvention.com. Well, let's get right to our interview with Deborah Hughes. I'm thrilled to have Deborah Hughes on with us on the Plein Air Podcast. Deborah, welcome. Thank you. So where are you today? Where are we talking? Um, I'm in Newport Beach. It's a gorgeous day. And I'm uh, heading to my studio right after this at the boatyard. <laughs> not, not too bad. Yeah, nice life. So uh, yeah. quite a different life from where you grew up. You grew up in the Midwest in uh, Indianapolis. I did. I lived there. Um, I loved it there. And I still love it there. I go back and see family all the time. But um, I got to go in two college courses at uh, John Heron School of Art when I was in sixth grade there. And so I started really young. My mom was an artist and my grandmother too. And they took me to the museum all the time to study the masters. And um, so I started young, started running young. <laughs> So when you grew up in Indianapolis, were you exposed to the the Hoosier salon, the Hoosier, Hoosier school, the the painters from uh, um, Bloomington or or I guess not Bloomington but Southern Indiana? Yeah, the T. C. Steele and all those uh, guys down there. Um, you know, they were always in the museum. So along with the masters, there was um, some of the more contemporary then um, painters that were also shown in the museum from time to time. So. Um, I definitely did then, but then after college, I got to work down in Nashville itself, and it was quite inspirational, and I got to work with CW Monday, actually, and it was really terrific experience for three years uh, painting down there. It's absolutely beautiful com com country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, and a, um, That is a beautiful area, and, and for those who are listening, it's Nashville, Indiana, not Nashville, Tennessee. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you think of Indiana as being flat, but down in Nashville, it's ro rolly hills and beautiful fall color. And, uh, and you know all about that. <laughs> well, as one who grew up in Indiana, um, we, Brown County was kind of the destination to see fall color. Definitely. That's right. I forgot. You're a Hoosier, aren't you? I am a Hoosier. Yes. I've Don't forgotten that. Me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, let's let's just talk about this heritage. You said your grandmother was an artist and your mother was an artist. Um, so obviously you grew up around it. You were exposed to it a lot. How did? Um, what are your first memories of of them and art? Um, I remember my grandmother who lived with us. Um, she would just do these beautiful little uh, line drawings, kind of like the Picasso drawings. 
and they were gorgeous. So that's pretty much all of her work that I would see that. And she did needlepoint and stuff like that, which was artistic. But my mom, you know, she was always uh, pulling out different kinds of materials to paint with. And um, I would cozy up right next to her and, you know, watch everything that she was doing. And then she started cutting up little um, mat boards for me to create on. And so I was um, doing lots of little florals and things that I would make up out of my mind, but at least I was creating my own art. And uh, then we, they would, should frame them and give them as gifts to people and stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it was neat. That's very positive encouragement. And do you remember some of the first paintings that you saw that, or, or any particular painting that may have uh, stuck in your mind as something that really inspired you? You mean that I did? No. Or that I saw? Uh, no, that you saw. <laughs> oh, that I saw. I would say definitely at the museum, the Monet's and the water lilies and the uh, full color and the um, inspiration from all of those massive murals and things like that. We had some really nice paintings of the Impressionists. And so that really hit me hard and I just fell in love with that. And started painting soon after that so it was great so you um did you have this desire to become a, a full-time artist when you were a kid you know it's funny i was drawing and painting all the time just like my mom was pretty much i guess and i was always doing new things pen and ink watercolor pastel um actually now that you say that re remember um going through the neighborhood and finding soft rocks in different driveways and then i would take the rocks and dip them in water and paint with them on the sidewalk and so I was doing pastel little, you know, paintings on the sidewalk. I, gosh, I couldn't have been more than six or seven or eight, somewhere in there. So most kids were so, doing lemonade stands and you were doing pastels right. on rocks. Yeah, yeah. It was really fun to go look for the soft yellow and the soft green. Oh, here's a really good one. And then I'd sit down with my little palette of rocks and just start scraping away on the sidewalk. It was really fun. And, you know, I ended up going into pastel for 17 years um, after college and painting with those. So it's kind of, it does kind of seem like it's in my blood from a very young, you know, young time. So you made the transition from pastel to oil. Uh-huh. And what prompted that? Well, in college, I painted in acrylic and oil and took courses. And then I went into uh, pastel in college, actually. And I just got hooked on that for so long. And I really enjoyed that. But it was kind of a different kind, uh, time when the paintings were all really bright. And I was kind of following that whole avenue, um, especially after I moved to California, because everything's so colorful here, you know, and wonderful. Um, but then the plein air scene started becoming super, um, you know, on my radar. I was like, what's going on with the Laguna plein air and, you know, and Carmel? I think were the first two really that uh, did that. And I wanted to get out and paint and get out of my studio and so I did a first few uh, get-togethers out painting with pastel, and I just felt like I missed the brush and I missed the texture of the paint, and that I, it was time for me to switch. So I dove in, and I had to take some workshops to get up to speed and change really my whole style. And who did you take workshops but from? Um, Ken Oster and Jeff Horn. Of course, Ken Oster, yeah. <laughs> and that was a treat. Yeah. But um, it's kind of interesting because my style, the way I like to scrub on my darks and keep them real thin and then lay on my middle values and lighter values with much thicker paint, it's a lot of layering and it's from my bas background in pastels that I think uh, a lot of my style still has a little bit of that technique into it. Interesting. So yeah. explain that a little bit more for somebody who does oil but might not really understand pastel. Well, pastel is really, boy, you really have to know your color theory. And there's a lot of layering going on. So to create some colors, you are vibrating colors and using complementary colors, you know. And, and um, so I was constantly referring in my mind to the color wheel when I was painting with pastels because of the layering. The more you layer, the more beautiful and rich it becomes. And then you also have the way to make the marks and, and uh, such, which also... When I paint, I paint very directly and I try to paint extremely confidently, you know, so I like to lay down my paint and leave it alone and let you see the brush strokes and the marks very similar to pastel. Well, that's, I think, one of the mottos. I remember listening to you teaching 
And that's one of the mottos that you were talking about is lay it down and leave it alone. You want to talk about that? Mm-hmm. It's a common problem for painters. It really is. Uh, that's a good kind of a trademark that I've developed because that's exactly what you need to do. And I have two terms that I refer to in my workshops, Erica. One is uh, the F word and one is the finger. <laughs> and the F word is futzing. Everybody is always futzing and they need to stop futzing and lay down the paint, leave it alone, and so that the people painting can see your brushwork and see that you're confident and you're enjoying your painting time. And then the finger part, I say, and then afterwards, don't be afraid to go in with your finger here and there and break a line, you know, smudge an edge. But those are kinds of things that people help, helps them to remember. And I think often people start painting and they, you know, they just start thinking, uh, or not thinking. I think they're just staring and not thinking and they keep painting, 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 painting the same spot. They're not sure. And that shows in the painting. And so I want people to you know, paint with confidence and have a plan, you know, so that the painting is enjoyable to look at and enjoyable to, to paint. Mm-hmm. You talked about breaking a line. That's something a lot of artists don't understand. Do you want to talk about that? Oh, sure. Um, I found that when you have a lot of hard edges in your painting or any really a straight line, it could be in a tree or the edge of a house, or it could be, you know, anywhere. Uh, it, the more straight lines you have, the more tension is in the painting and it gives it a feeling of uncomfortable, you know, like it, it's stressed out. <laughs> it's kind of how I think of it. So if you go in and break those lines or when you lay down a line, you do it in more like Morse code, you do you know, long and then a dash and then a longer piece and then a couple dashes or something like that. It tends to really relax the painting and relax the viewer and makes it feel like it has more atmosphere and it just makes it more um, enjoyable to view. You know, if you look at really good painters and really good paintings, that's something that um, I didn't used to notice, but I, I remember looking at Richard Schmid's um, architecture paintings and even uh, getting his video and, and watching how he laid that, that perfect line down, but then he'd go in and he'd mm-hmm. break that up because he didn't want that to be completely drawing the eye. So that's essentially Mm-mm. what you're doing. Exactly right. Yeah, any lines that are complete are going to cause some tension. And so you want people to be able to move around without feeling the tension. So a lot of times I think the more... Um, you know, beginning painters don't realize that. Of course, their paintings do look very stiff. And often, maybe what they need to be doing is deconstructing a little bit more here and there, not being afraid, you know, to experiment and push an edge or smudge something. Of course, you can't futz. So (laughs) there's a fine line there. You (laughs) You don't want to turn everything to mud. Because we all tend to fall in love with our work. You know, we feel like we we accomplished something. And then, you know, you, you, you go in and you break it up or you mess it up, you scrape it down, it's it's always heartbreaking. But that's an important lesson, isn't it? It really is. And often, you know, if I scrape something down and then I start again because I'm just too stubborn to give up on it, it turns out so much better. You know, and and so messing things up isn't really that the way to look at it. The way to look at it is that you're gonna just deconstruct it a little bit and let it have a little bit of je ne sais quoi and um try to keep some of those passages that let you break from one area to another with your eye. And it ends up making the painting much more enjoyable, uh, has a much more sophisticated feel. And it is something you kind of have to learn because it's scary at first. It is scary, but uh, it's it's a really important lesson. It's probably something that should be incorporated into all workshops. Okay, everybody scrape it down now. Oh, my gosh. That's a good idea. (laughs) Of course, you'd be Uh, You'd hear everybody go, what? You'd be very unpopular. (laughs) Uh-huh. <laughs> but the that you know the, if you stare at a scene long enough and you're you're standing there painting it and then you scrape it down the second time around it, it comes much easier doesn't it <clears throat> it does mm-hmm. it's just like if you did a sketch a couple of sketches first and plus now that you've got all the paint even though you scraped it down you've kind of got all your shapes you know where your shapes are and so you still have a plan so you just want to go in maybe with a fresh approach and cleaner paint and try it again and probably turn out way better. Yeah, well, one of my favorite things to do is to scrape and then leave some of it underneath, and and, and somehow it's that depth and that texture that really makes things interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. 
It does. Like I do like to scrape into the dark sometimes too. Same thing. Just gives a variety of textures on the surface. And, you know, I'm really attracted to the darks when they're transparent and you can uh, scrub into them a little bit with the dark paint and it, you can kind of see into the canvas a little bit and it gives the darks a little bit of luminosity and not feeling so heavy. So sometimes people will put in darks and I think they keep wanting it to get darker. So they keep putting more paint on it. We're really, uh, it's going to work much better if it's uh, thin and then also allows you to lay other strokes on top if you want to. So that's the thin thick part is a really important part to understand too. There's so much to, you know, understand it takes a long time to pull it all together. So for the person who um, hasn't tried to accomplish transparency in their, in their darks, their shadows, is this something that you, you lay it in as you're beginning, you're, you're using a, a Gamsol or Terps or something when you lay things in originally, or are you, you uh, painting really thin? Um, I, what are you, what's your process like? Um, I do, I like to maybe just get a little, spot of uh, Gamsol in my brush just so there's a little bit of moisture, but I don't like to use many mediums. I like to try to just work with the paint as much as possible. And then um, I use a bright brush. So the bright brushes are the shorter long flats and they will push the paint into the surface. So you start with the um, brights or short flats and you get some paint and you want to get enough so you're not looking like dry brushing. You have to get on there and push it around. And the more you push the paint around, it starts to get some of your uh, messy marks in it with your paintbrush, which I think is really cool that it, when that shows at the end. But it also pushes into the canvas enough that it just gives it a little teeny bit of luminosity. It's very hard to describe, but it really makes the dark passages extra special that way. And I find that often you can change colors. It doesn't really matter if you use you know, dark green under a bush, you can scrub in dark red, the lizard and crimson. It looks just beautiful. And, you know, who would have thought, but actually it works terrific. That's one of my secrets. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> oh, well, the secret, yeah. secret is out. So uh, you train a lot of painters. You, you have an online <clears throat> training course. Uh, you have mm -hmm. done lots of workshops. What do you think are the core essentials that really everybody needs to focus on first? Because, you know, we have... Uh, we have so many different ways of learning. I, when I was in the Adirondacks recently, I had a kind of a round table with everybody there, and we were kind of talking about how everybody learned to paint and what their process was like, like learning and what turned them on, what turned them off. And everybody had different opinions, but what is your opinion? What's the, what's the right way? If, if somebody came up to you today and they said, Deborah, um, I want to start painting. I don't want to make the... You know, I don't want to make any mistakes. Of course, they all going to make mis are all going to make mistakes. But what's mm -hmm. the the track that you would recommend? Well, I would say to find somebody that's a really good teacher first. That'll explain to you what what you're doing and why you're doing it, so that you're easy. You know, it's easier for you to remember and understand, and rather than just watching demos. You know, and really start at the beginning with the color wheel. People think that so you know, rudimentary and that, oh, you know, I don't, I did that back in grade school, but you know, it's so important. I think about it all the time and use it all the time to my benefit uh, in a painting. Um, uh, so that and value is so hard to understand. People need to try to really take some time to understand what it means for value because the values in a painting is the most important thing. Your, where your darks are, where your lights are, how you gray out, you know, to get atmosphere and distance and things like that. And um, then to, of course, start with big shapes. And people want to start with detail, it seems like. Kind of like they want to put the icing on the cupcake before they bake the cupcake. <laughs> That's kind of how I think of it, you know. Um, the easiest way to, and most fun way to do a painting is to get the, all the big shapes in. And then you can lay just this, that, and other thing on top. And all of a sudden, it says what you wanted to say, but you didn't have to draw anything. You know what I mean? And um, so that's what I try to teach, a technique that keeps it really simple and really basic, but lets everybody have a plan, you know, how to understand what they're doing and what brushes will do the right trick. Um, oftentimes, the, the using the wrong brush will be a problem, and they don't realize why. And I can't get just this just right. Well, if, you're, if you get out the right tool, it'll make it a lot easier. So there's a lot of simple, basic things like that that I like to 
recommend for people to, you know, get off on the right foot. So when you uh, when you teach a workshop to very beginners, uh, or do you recommend very beginners coming into your workshop? Um, are are <laughs> you starting with values? Are you saying okay, let's do a value study? Oh um, well, you know it's fun, Eric. Um, over the years, by teaching, taking, and teaching workshops, I've developed a series of like five or six in a row, and they build on each other. But the biggest thing that I'm known for is that I really try to help you understand every step of the way, how to do things and why to do them. But you definitely start with basics. You have to get the basics. You can't jump ahead. You know, you can't jump up to sixth grade if you're only in first grade or whatever. So it's really important to go back and learn all those things and really get them down. So I do one class that's just about talking about all the basics, which includes um, the color wheel, color theory, what is value? What does a grayscale mean? You know, how do you see a color, one color in all these different values? You know, how, how can you utilize that? And then I do a lot of um, step-by-step paint alongs where the students draw the design with me. You know, we like to mark our canvas in thirds and look for a focal point. I'm really firm believer in focal points for a painting. And um, so that way you're sure that your subject isn't going to be right smack in the middle or way off to the edge, you know, that you have to create something to draw the, um, the viewer through the painting. So you're like a poet or a musician. You have to plan how you're going to entertain. So, you, you know, you don't only just think, Oh, I'm going to set up and try to copy that tree in that park and that sunset or whatever. You more have to design a beautiful melody and have a plan and a way to um, achieve that. So, <clears throat> through simple techniques, I try to help everybody to understand that and also to allow them to make mistakes and have fun with doing that. Um, you know, lay it down, leave it alone. But if you make a mistake, don't fix it. You know, let's just see at the end, that part of the painting might be the coolest part, you know, our favorite part of the whole painting. So it's it ends up being a lot of fun. It go really slow with the paint alongs. We, you know, design the painting together. Then we lay in all our darks together. You know, we talk about what brush to use, what technique to use, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, move into the middle values and highlights. When I get to the very end, I use a rigger brush, and it, it's the perfect brush for, for the job because it's long. It's got the longer hairs, and the longer hairs let the paint sit on top of other paint. And so I really teach everything really slowly and step by step. Oh, sounds like you've got a, a great process going now. Yeah, it's funny how many people don't realize how important brushes are Um, because the shape of the brush and the way you use it is super important. And, you know, nobody taught me this. I finally figured it out on my own. It's um, but it's so true. It's the longer, like a long flat versus a short flat. The short flat will push the paint into the surface and the long flat will lay it on top because it's longer and the paint just glides off the brush and onto your, onto your canvas. And so the rigger brush at the end, if you're trying to use a little detail brush, then it will push in. And I'm like, oh, no wonder. It's a short, a short hair brush. It's pushing in. I don't want it to. I want it to set on top. So then I get the rigger brush, the longer one, and the paint just sits right on top. It's like, wow, there's a technique to brush, you know, the brushes and everything. So I think that's cool. It's just fun to learn all the, all the tools and how they work. Absolutely. Do you do you do any knife painting at all? I do. Uh huh. And, and when and yeah, where do it's you great. Use a knife? What what? When and where do you use a knife? Under what instances do you do that kind of? Oh, a knife. I'm sorry. I thought you said knight like, as oh. a nocturne. Ah. <laughs> yes. Um, I do like to use a palette knife. I like to use a palette knife to, um, well, I use it to mix all, uh, some colors that on my. I have a palette that I call, it's kind of silly, but it's true. I call it the keep you out of trouble palette. And I mix certain colors from others on my palette um, rather than squirting them out of tube because then they're a little bit less intense and a little bit more harmonious. But then when applying paint, I really like to um, use a palette knife to scrape down, but then also at the focal point to take a little paint and lay it um, right in there with the palette knife to add yet one more texture, you know, or... um, also, a lot of people have never painted in palette knife, and so 
uh, one or two paintings in my Lay It Down and Leave It Alone course, we do all in palette knives so that people can see how easy it is to fill in the big shapes and and how to keep paint clean because you're not going to go really keep going over it. And so people end up really enjoying, enjoying doing that. It's really fun. So everybody out there should give it a try. Just use a small size canvas, you know, and give, give it a whirl. Well, uh, you, as you know, uh, I've fallen in love with one of the colors that you basically have created. Um, you were at the Plein Air Convention, I think it was two years ago in San Diego, and mm-hmm. you had uh, done some demonstration, and you had some paint colors that you had manufactured um, called Marine Violet. I don't know if you have mm-hmm. any other colors or not, but um, I, I bought a couple of tubes from you, and I think I've since bought several because it's such a wonderful color. It just works for everything. Tell everybody about that color. I love this color. Um, it's one that I have mixed on my palette with the palette knife for 15, 20 years. And it's a purple, super dark purple. And I love it because it's already muted. So I do it um, mostly with a little blue. And then you have to add some red to get it to purple. And then it takes a little bit of a raw sienna or a, a dark yellow mixed in. But it's just the right um, color to not get you in trouble. So if it, if purple's on the market, you know, I tried a lot of them and they were so strong that they would take over my painting. And I couldn't find anything that was just the right thing. So I started mixing this and it's designed so that it won't go as you lighten it. It won't go to red violet and it won't go to pink as you lighten it even further, which can cause so much trouble in somebody's painting, especially when they're just learning. They won't realize that their purple just turned to pink or red violet. And so um, also when you're doing darks, um, I love having a warm dark and a cool dark. So in the foreground, you could possibly have some warm rocks uh, with a dark, you know, <clears throat> dark brown. And then that dark brown, as it goes into the distance, will turn to a cool note and it would be a marine violet. Exactly. And then the further it goes, it would just be marine violet with some white in it. And so um, it just translates to so many things. I use it for distant land mass. I just go right to my marine violet for any distant land mass in a painting and add, take it to a certain middle value, and it works fantastic. Um, I'm often painting boats. And the harbor is filled with all these boats, and they're all white and gray, and the water is blue, and the sky is blue. And you're like, oh, my God, what am I going to do with this? You know, how do I solve this? this problem. So the marine violet has come in super handy for the side of this boat that's in the shadow. So um, one of my classes, I really focus on that. It's, um, well, we do it in color, the new one I have coming up called um, Color Secrets. But we talk about what color is red in the sun, what color is red in the shadow, what color is blue in the sun, what color is blue in the shade. And people always have a lot of trouble with white. They know what color white is basically in the sun. It's not necessarily white, but maybe a tad warmer. But when it goes into shadow, it's often this marine violet with white in it. (laughs) Mixed to the right value, it makes a perfect white in the shade. And so it solves a lot of problems for me and gives me a different color rather than a gray, you know, or a blue to put into a painting. And so I can't live without it. It's always the first color I run out of on my palette, no matter when I'm painting, where I'm painting. (laughs) So well, I'm happy me. to have it in a tube. You sold me on it, and I and I did a painting uh, just yesterday, and it was a, a gray day on a lake, and basically I used marine violet and white, and that pretty much did the entire painting in marine violet. Oh, cool! Because it, you can get such range out of it, and I'm the same way. Is that I, this is not intended to be a infomercial for marine violet, folks? By the way, but mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. It, yeah, it thanks. Is, um, it, you know, it is a magical color, and, and I find that that's the one I run out of the most, too, because I'm using it. I, I use one or two colors a lot, and that's probably the one that I'm using either the most or second most. And so it's it's very valuable. So you'll probably get a rash of orders for marine violet now. So Oh, great. Good. I hope well, so. Well, um, Gamblin has been nice enough to put it together for me, and we have a new batch coming out at the end of the summer, so we should be all ready to go. Well, and, and that, uh, that, also and working. How do they get that? They just go to Deborah Hughes. Uh, oh yes, thank you. Because you can't get it from Gamblin or from Blick or anywhere like that. You have to go to my website, which is uh, DebraHughes.com. That's and I have to spell it. 
Yeah, D E B R A H U S E dot com. And um I think we have it on the paint like a pro dot US site too. I'm sure we do. Yeah, probably. So um either way would be great. I know I guarantee you'll love it. <laughs> so um you, you know, we we talk a lot uh about painting for beginners on this uh, podcast because we get a lot of beginners. We are up to uh, well over a quarter million people who are listening now. And a lot of people have discovered painting through the podcast, have shown up at the convention because of the podcast. But the, um, the intermediate people are bugging me and saying, yeah, well, what about us? You know, let's talk about how do I get to the next level uh, because I'm not a mm-hmm. painter. So what's your best advice for people who kind of, they feel like they're, they've, they've got all their basics down, they're doing really well, they're doing fairly accomplished paintings, but they're not getting to the higher level, which is going to get them invited to the, you know, the, the better shows and the and, and mm-hmm. the better events and so on. What, what's your recommendation for them? Um, I think the most important thing is to check and see if they're getting form, meaning um, do their shapes look round or square? Are you following the light through the painting? Sometimes people forget to follow the light through the painting and they it hits one side of the tree and then the other side is in shade and it hits the ground and it goes to the right, you know, if the sun is at the left. So I think people lose track sometimes of where is the light and how to paint the light, because that is, you know, you've heard that saying so many times, but the reason it's so important is that the light gives the painting drama and interest and intrigue, whether it's foggy whether it's night scene or whether it's bright sunlight, it's got to have the light has to follow through the entire painting. And um, in a day scene, if you are starting to get flat shapes or you have sun coming from two different places on your, in your painting, then your painting will be flat immediately. And I think that's what people forget the most is to check that light. How do you and if you have a shadow, Pardon? How do you remind yourself to do this? Oh, you know, I do that all the time. Um, I'll just make sure that I put, if if I'm painting in a studio, I could put, like, I paint right on the wall in my studio, and I'll put, you know, a mark over here to remind me, don't forget the sun is up here to the left, Deborah. <laughs> you know, don't lose track, because that's so important. So um, when you're outdoors painting, of course, you're looking at the light, but the light is constantly changing. So part of... Part of painting and the most important part of painting that people don't realize is that you have to plan and strategize for a good painting. You have to have something that you're trying to say. You have to be able to get a good design. You have to be able to understand how the light is going to work and how you're going to key the light. Is the light cool with the shadows warm? Is the light warm with the shadows cool? Um, But also if you're outdoors, you can't forget that the sun is moving and you have to stick with your original plan no matter what. So you see it. And, you, you know, get your darks in and you have to keep those where they are. You can't change things. So that's why the lay it down, leave it alone is really important. If you scrub in those darks first, you'll know where your shadows are. You'll know where your light is. And then you start to fill in the middle and the light values from there. And, it, and then you can also adjust the darks. But basically the two things, you have to have light and dark, unless it's a night scene. Even then you're going to want to have light and dark. Um, and you just can't get a mix. You can't get mixed up <laughs> where the sun is. So I'd say that by far is the most important thing. Do you have a limit of amount of time that you typically spend when you're outdoors painting? Mm-hmm. I'd say about two, two, two and a half hours. Yeah. And max two and a half. And, and then, you know, if it's something big, you have to come back the next day at the same time and, and work on it some more. How often do you do that? Will you take, will you take a big canvas out and, and repeat? Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. Um, I do that at plein air events a lot um, because often at at a plein air event, if you can find something you think is going to be a a showstopper or an award winner, or you hope so anyhow, you might want to try to tackle it on a bigger size um, to really get the attention that it deserves. And so you really have to go back uh, somewhere, you know, more than once. I I did one big one once on location in Easton, but I lucked out because it – the sun was out at the very beginning and the very end, and the whole middle was cloudy. So at the beginning, I was able to set up my light and sh- shadows. And then in the middle, I wasn't too hot because I was out, in, out on a dock. 
And so I wasn't too hot. So I could just keep following my plan of attack. And then at the end, thank God, and it was six hours I worked on this thing. At the end, the sun came out again, at least got me that I could see the drama that I wanted to push from the original starting time. So the light was coming from a different spot, but I could see the drama that I, you know, wanted to make sure I captured. And so I was, um, that was one and only time I've done it all at once, but usually you want to come back the next day and, you know, give it another go. And actually by then your darks have um, dried a little bit, you know, so you have an even uh, better start. You're a little ahead of the game. So what is probably laid in all your big shapes. What does plein air mean to you? Um, painting outdoors. Is that what you mean in general or? Well, the reason I asked the question is, is my critics will tell you that, um, if, if they're emailing me, which happens pretty frequently, is they will say, well, they'll, they'll say, well, that picture you put on the cover of Plein Air magazine was not clearly not done in Plein Air or, uh or you'll get, uh, and, and I'm not being critical of any of them, by the way, but you'll get the purist who will say, Look, you paint it in, you paint it outdoors. Once you're done in a single session, you're done. You never bring it back a second time. You never touch it up in the studio. Uh, it, a plein air painting is a plein air painting. And then, of course, you have others who, who like Kevin McPherson, will say, I take my study, I match the colors, I do a big piece in the studio, um, and I'm using it as a reference. So, you know, to me, plein air is a lot of different meanings to a lot of different people and, and just really however you approach it. But do you have any, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> any dogma on that? <clears throat> no, I think it's, you know, why, why argue about it? I mean, just <laughs> go do what you want to do and enjoy your time. That's right. And as long as you're getting paintings that you enjoy and other people enjoy, then so, <laughs> I mean, please yourself, you know, it's up to you for it however you want but like for a plain air event they want you painting out on location they don't want you hiding in a hotel room and looking at photographs you took yesterday you know or something like that and they want people to enjoy meeting you and coming upon you um, and seeing what you're doing and learning about who you are where you're from why you like it here you know and thank you so much for you know making me look twice at the scene I pass by it every day you know it's just makes it so wonderful when the artists are in town and all of that is, is terrific. And as far as, um, you know, getting notes out and doing a big studio painting and, or going out, a lot of the California Impressionists would take their Model Ts out into the desert and the mountain areas and paint two or three different days on a giant painting. I mean, it's all good. <laughs> and you're painting from the back of a boat. That's right. Yeah. Now, that's all it, good too. Is, is that, that's I can on drink your a beer wine painting. And it's worth looking at. Is that actually something you do or is that staged? Do you actually see Oh, no you, way. You paint? Oh, yeah. Um, it, it's great. We have a sport fishing boat and it has a, a rear deck and a bow that's flat and it's got a fly bridge on top and those are all flat areas. Um, of course, the water isn't flat. It's It's moving. Hopefully, you know, not too much. <laughs> But getting the, the location from the boat looking at the land is, you know, like no other. And why not paint while you're there? So often I'll have uh, my husband and I all take uh, a trip specifically to Catalina Island, for instance. And we've gone, um, we get a, a mooring ball for the first night and then we get up, you know, at 4 a.m. And we start working our way around the island um, over the course of uh, different, you know, five nights or something like that. And we'll anchor in different coves and I'll paint and Randy will fish or swim or tinker around on the boat. But wow, we found so many places you can never see from land and they're so beautiful. It's just stunning. And so I don't mind a little bit of rocking, you know, I have good sea legs, so that's no problem. Except for um, when you're trying to add detail, kind of have to hold your breath and hope it <laughs> lands where you want it to go. <laughs> I'm laughing but, because I... Uh, I I paint from a little wooden boat and, uh, you know, sometimes a skier will go by and then it's like, oh boy. Right. Exactly. I know I was painting off, off the coast of uh, Laguna Beach for the plein air event uh, a couple of years ago. And or might have even been, yeah, a couple of years ago. And uh, Randy dropped the anchor for me so I could paint. And it's so funny how many boats wanted to come over and see what we were doing. 
And I'm thinking, no, don't come over here. No, 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 stay away. Because <laughs> no, I don't need the rocking, you know, they're trying to see if we're looking at a whale or something, I'm sure. Because why are we holding still? A lot of waving paint. When yeah. You're, you're painting. Exactly. So, funny. Um, how, how many shows a year do you do typically? How do you choose which shows you're going to um, do? Because I know you get invited invited to them all. Um, how, how, you know, how much how much of your time do you spend doing these shows? How much do you time you have? Yeah. You have an art gallery. What? How do you balance all of this? Well. Um, I feel like I have to have a lot of balls in the air, kind of, so to speak, uh, to make sure that I'm um, maintaining a high profile, but also so I make sure that I have money always, you know, coming in from somewhere to keep things rolling so that I don't have to go sell shoes or something like that, cars. <laughs> um, so I, I do. I uh, At first I started doing, I when I started the planar scene and got, started getting into some of the shows, I did like 10 a year. It was crazy. But there was a lot of them here in California, so that was cool. But once I started traveling more, I realized I wanted to do less shows because it's just so hard to get anything else done when you're traveling that much. And it's hard to be away from home. So I picked out my favorites, um, you know, Maui, of course, who doesn't want to go to Hawaii and paint. And uh, the Forgotten Coast is fabulous. But, you know, you still have to be invited every year. You never know if you're going to be invited. Uh, Easton, I'll be going this summer. And, uh, Sonoma, I've been going to Sonoma for I think I'm one of only three that have been for all 16 years. I think that's where I first met you is uh, at, I think, the first or second Sonoma show. Oh, really? Yep. That's cool. I was thinking we met at Laguna. Well, uh, we may have, but that could be. Yeah. Maybe yeah, I said Laguna, hello of once we, we were in Sonoma. Uh-huh. Laguna was the yeah, first. That was... My, Laguna was my first exposure to a plein air show. Uh-huh. It's a great show, too, isn't it? Sure. Fabulous location. Excellent show. This year is a, a 20th year anniversary for Laguna Plain Air, so big doings yeah. this year. And then as far as uh, keeping everything going, um, you know, people might not realize it, but in order to be a professional artist and uh, do enough work, you have to have, you know, places, of course, to sell your work. You have to make money at the Plain Air events. You have to... Um, I, had, I have an art gallery that actually I just got a new partner, but 20 years I've had this art gallery with my name on it, which is great. It's built a giant, you know, local reputation for me here. And, um, but what I was getting at is that, you know, you can't do that without help. I have so many helpers. I don't know what I would do without my bookkeeper, my graphic designer, my web person, um, you know, it's just hard as Eric Rhodes of all people knows how hard it is to do everything right you well, have to have a, yeah. an army of people absolutely and i've had other artists uh ask me you know how do you do all it and i explain you know i i delegate and they go oh, i should do that more because you really get so much more done you know and by having helpers and you make more money and it's it's good it's all good it keeps your sanity <laughs> you know so what um, one of the things that I, I run into a lot, uh, there are artists out there who are vehemently opposed to the idea of selling out. You know, I'm an artist. I'm, I, I don't want my art to be uh, impacted or have it reflected on the fact that I'm selling paintings. But if you really want to survive, it, you, I mean, if you want to make a living doing it, then you're going to have to figure out how to make it through that hurdle. How do you mm -hmm. how do you get people over that hurdle? How do you help them to accept the fact that this is m maybe something they should consider? Um, something they should consider as far as making it, money from? Yeah, selling. It's yeah. not for everybody, oh, well, obviously. No, it's not. But um, if you, unless you're independently wealthy, if you really want to make a go of painting as a career, so that's the difference. You know, it's my career. It's my lifelong career. And um, so I need to be selling things so that I can travel and buy frames and buy equipment. And, you know, you have to, uh, I don't worry about that part. You're just so grateful when somebody loves your work and takes it home. I mean, that's, that's, there's no guarantee. So you have to just keep painting the best you can and, 
and presenting your work to the public and hopefully um you know it the universe will will provide it's kind of how i boiled down to it you know i can't worry about things too much i try to just keep uh creating as much as i can and uh you know take time to grow this is my time i'm going to try to really uh grow my uh works and larger pieces and stuff like that but you just um i need to have things selling too <laughs> so i i do okay i have to admit i do local scenes when i really have to at the at my little gallery on balbo island if i can you know produce uh 3 4 5 local scenes or if i spend time on a big regatta they sell they always sell and the big regattas are fun to paint i love doing those so you know, I do kind of sell out in that way a little bit. But, you know, when I need to pay my staff and I need to pay my bills, then I need to, you know, do what it takes to make it happen. Well, I have a theory, and that is I'd rather, no offense to people who clean toilets, but I'd rather um, be painting something rather than cleaning toilets if it's going to pay the bills. And even if it's something that I know is going to sell and it's going to help me pay the bills, then it hopefully gives me time to do what I, I love and want to paint later. I'll get a letter or an email about that for sure because there's some people just don't think that that's the right approach. But uh, it, well, it, it doesn't you're mean not you're painting compromising because of yourself. That. Yeah. You're painting because you love to paint. Right. And you and should be grateful if you're making a living at it because, you know, how many people get to do what we get to do? So... That's right. But it takes hard work, and, and it takes a lot of commitment. And um, then there's plenty of people that maybe don't need to make a living at it, but they love to paint, and, you know, it's all good. Yeah, selling isn't for everybody, and and, and it shouldn't be pushed on everybody. So in terms Mm-mm. of inspiration, um, who inspires you? Oh, boy. Uh, the first name that comes to mind is Armin Hansen. Um, I went to the Carmel uh, Museums up there and found Armin Hansen, and he's a paints beautiful um, ocean and boat scenes. And he um, is no longer with us, but his paintings are absolutely brought me to tears. I mean, they're and they aren't tight uh, by any means, but they're just full of passion. You can tell and feel the passion that he had for the sea and the men in the sea and the uh, people, you know, all involved with feeding, feeding us and all that. And um, I've just, that's just gripped my heart ever since then. Right, and so I have that. W- once we sign off, I'm going to give you a name of a private collector in your area or near, not too far from your area, who has uh, a handful of those that you should go see. Oh, neat. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I can't. Wonderful. I'd tell everybody, but then the phone would ring off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. I love to paint the boats and, you know, um, the thing too about being, you know, we're boaters and you have wooden boats and you have some beautiful classics and you enjoy, I'm sure, looking at many other beautiful boats as, as do I. So we have that and share that. Um, and the boats, you know, today are all steel or fiberglass. And it just dawned on me that if you look at the old pictures of Harbor here, even in Newport Beach, you know, there's old uh, tall ships and there's old classic um, boats in the harbor everywhere. And they're everywhere because, of course, that's all there was. We call them old classics now. But I'm afraid one day there won't be even any of those anymore. Now we only see them here and there and here and there. You know what I mean? So um, you can tell when, when, somebody, I think, when somebody knows boats and they're painting boats, you can tell they know boats. You can tell a difference. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, my husband keeps an eye on mine just to make sure I'm not missing an angle or something like that. Thank God. Well, you did a painting. But, um, you did a painting at the plein air convention, and I remember commenting to you that it reminded me of an Edgar Payne because Payne did such beautiful boats and sails. Oh, and, and you had what a compliment. The, you had a, a a tonalist feel to that particular painting, which was was just yummy. Thank you. Gosh, that's such an honor. I love Edgar Payne. I mean, his paintings, too, you can't stop looking at them. They're so engaging. But not only that, but they're historical documents. You know, they, they tell of the uh, the way things were and in such a beautiful way. The color is beautiful. The design is incredible. But it also has a whole story and history, which makes it fantastic. So um, 
I kind of feel that way with the boats that I paint. I like to try to find those old classics and try to tell that their story, you know, because uh, sometimes when, when you go to Florida and Forgotten Coast and you go to Eastern Maryland or two places, only two places that I've been quite a bit to paint. And, you know, they have boats that I, I'll see one year and then come back and they are gone the next. And there's a lot of boats, you know, that's too expensive to fix them. And so they break them up and throw them away. And it's just, it's just like heartbreaking. And so every time I go to these places, I want to paint and capture as many of the boats as I can because they tell a tale of a, a different time uh, and, and the men and women that go out to get oysters and get shrimp and, you know, gosh, it's just the sea is incredible. And the whole history of the ships and everything is so incredible. So um, very passionate about trying to find them and capture them and uh, tell that story in a painting. That's really fun. Well, your passion comes across. So what have we not touched on today before we wrap this up? What what are you dying to talk about that we haven't touched on? <laughs> that was it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, um, same thing with the um, plein air. Well, let's just talk about plein air for a minute. Um, what it has brought to just this whole genre of that has come resurfaced. You know, it's, it's just painting outdoors, but bringing together people for events and things like that. That's really uh, brought together lots of, collectors and lots of artists and now we are not all in our studio and we don't know each other you know we just read about each other in a magazine or something like that and anyone can go to these events with all the artists and meet everybody and and watch them paint and you know it's like a whole side giant bonus that comes with that whole deal being outdoors in a beautiful area and getting to meet local people and find secret spots and you know, all that stuff is really fabulous. Well, where else can but we're you be, blessed. Where else can you be outdoors doing something and somebody walks up to you and starts talking to you and engages you? And it's a great way to to, to get to know people. Of course, sometimes you don't want that. But um, I like to call it the new mind. golf because it's it's mentally challenging. Oh. It's artistic. It's stimulating. Uh, you It's social. You get to meet new friends. Um it's it's very engaging on a lot of different levels and and my goal is to not only help continue to grow it but to grow it well to make sure that people are getting educated properly that they're getting good instruction from people like yourself with, with workshops or online academies or videos or otherwise because mm -hmm. uh what we don't want to have happen is we don't want the words plein air to mean fast and poor quality we want you know, it's, mm -mm. it's the old joke. How long did it take you to paint this? 30 years and two hours. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. That's uh, so right. Lots and lots and lots of uh, pennies in the jar. Somebody used to say, oh, just keep thinking of it as a piggy bank. And every time you paint, a penny goes in the piggy bank. And pretty soon your piggy bank will be full and your paintings will be fabulous. <laughs> I thought that was so cute. Yeah. I've never forgotten that. So I think... For your whole life, you're putting pennies in the in the piggy bank so you can express and um, enjoy. Well, yeah, uh, and they aren't teaching. You know, they aren't teaching in schools the uh, arts uh, like Sonoma. They give all of the money uh, raised for arts and schools in Sonoma County. Yeah. There aren't any classes at all, and so hopefully by being exposed, um, you know, to the plein air events, even kids will get to check it out and parents. And well, we have one coming up uh, here on Babel Island called Just Plain Fun. And we do this fun thing where I try, I was trying to get people to really interact with artists. So we do a plein air passport and um, the people come in, all the public can come into the gallery. So one, we got them in the gallery. Two, they can pick up their plein air passport and start to go like on a scavenger hunt looking for the artists that are painting around the Babel Island. Gets them involved and then they have to stop and get the signature of the artist in the passport. So they have to say hello and so that scary part's over. Now they're looking at the artists and seeing what they're doing. The kids are seeing the artists create, you know, and, and um, then the um, people have to come back in the gallery. And now there's some paintings up, you know, so now they're starting to buy things. And I think it's a really fun interaction um, mm -hmm. to get just to get everybody involved and see that, you know, you can talk to artists. They're nice. <laughs> they won't bite. Yes. And you might actually enjoy watching the process and, you know, some of our friends let, you know, um, kids, you know, put a brush stroke on the painting or something like that from time to time. And yeah, I do that. So, yeah, that's cool. 
they get so mesmerized, just like we did when we were kids. <laughs> well, you know, any, anything, you know? To, anything to inspire a kid. That's the way I feel about it. That's right. Yeah. That's well, so Deborah, true. This, I, has we been, were... this has been fantastic. Uh, I, I'm sure that we could go on forever, and I understand you're going to be starting your own podcast, and I wish you well with that. Don't take all my listeners away, but when you get it going, make sure you let us know, and we'll uh, we'll give you a shout-out. Oh, it's so sweet. But actually, I'm just sticking with my online courses. Oh, okay. So you're <laughs> yeah. not doing a podcast. No, po- no podcast. Oh, mm-hmm. I, somehow I got No, that. you're too good at it. I could never be as good as you. <laughs> well, I wonder how that happened. No? But just for fun, there is going to be a special um, surprise that we'll give away on... Um, on our paintlikeapro.us website if you go and check out our classes and ask to be uh, signed up for when we release the next one, then you get a free uh, video sent along so you can see how I paint. Oh, that's nice. Well, you're a good promoter. Yeah. Well, thank oh, you thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for your time today and, and for your generosity and for inspiring all of us. You're, you're a fabulous painter. You're a oh, nice thank person. thank you. Uh, you're very generous with uh, with other people when you teach. I've watched that process, and I, I encourage people to um, attend your workshops, go learn from you. You're you're, um, thank you. you're the real deal. I really want to help. I really do. <laughs> and thank you, Eric. I really enjoyed speaking with you and all your friends. This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art. Proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. Well, thanks again to Deborah Hughes. What an amazing painter. Today's podcast was brought to you by Fall Color Week in the Canadian Rockies. I hope you'll join us. You can learn more at fallcolorweek.com. And of course, by the Plin Air Convention in San Francisco next April. You got to get those seats. Yes, you got to get them now because it's going to sell out like they always do, and you don't want to be stuck. Uh, grab your seats while you can at Plin Air Convention. Also, if you've not seen my blog where I talk about art and life and just general stuff, you can check it out. It's called Sunday Coffee, and you can find it at coffeewitheric.com. And my new book, Make More Money, Selling Your Art. All you got to do is search my name on Amazon. My name is Eric Rhodes. It's fun this week. Let's do it again next week. We'll see you then. I'm the publisher and founder of Plenary Magazine. And remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye.